Well, yours, but did tell me, by the way, that he emceed the Jerry Lee Lewis show at the Maker. <laughs> Jerry Lee came. Uh, so I feel like he's maybe moved his entire life up here for us, and we we'll want you to take a look at that before you go on to that. Uh, Rodney's one of those guys that if you, I mean, when you're talking about early time, he grew up on the square, knows a lot about that, and he's graciously agreed to come and speak to us tonight. And when I called him and talked to him, he finally said, you know, James, why haven't you asked me before? <laughs> well, we've asked you tonight, Ronnie. We're glad you're here. This chair down here to this lady sitting on the table. Excuse me. We were always on a low budget when I put on shows. I'm used to doing most of the work. <laughs> I like to get serious to start with by mentioning something that's very, very sensitive to me. There will be no jokes about the bald-headed men in the audience. <laughs> no, some of us are living proof that Rogaine is not for everyone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Even though you were warned in the newsletter and on the newspaper, I appreciate your courage. I would like to thank Mr. James Wilkins for inviting me. I am a member of this club and have been going into my second year, but I still don't have a name tag because I've never been to a meeting. But I'm, <laughs> I'm here to stay. So if y'all want to blame somebody, blame Wilkins. Now, he mentioned my father. I'm going to have to try to talk fast because we're going to try to put about 50 years into a few minutes. My father was instrumental, of course, in me being here, but also in the fact that I did work side by side with him for 12 years. He was one of my heroes, along with several of my uncles and scoutmasters and Weldon and different people like that. Daddy was only five foot five, but he stood about 10 feet tall. I don't think anybody really wanted to mess with him. He was a great guy and a great teacher. He spoke six languages. He came from the old country. They considered him uh, downtown as a scholar. Several of the law firms called on him to interpret different things. and. Uh, I'm going to mention him several times in this because I think he's got a lot to do with the historical society. It's too bad he wasn't a little bit more forceful when they tore the courthouse down. We'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Some of these things I'm going to tell you come from people who actually told me who saw them. Now, you're going to say it's hearsay, and that didn't really happen. Well, some of these things I did not see myself, but the people that saw them, actually saw them, told me about it. They, working in Camel's Candy Kitchen behind the counter for many years, in the afternoon, things were slow, and people would come there and hang out, and they would tell me these stories first person. Okay, we're going to tell a lot of those. First thing I want to tell you about, because most of you have looked at some of this stuff up here, and I want all of you to please look at it, if you like, when the meeting is over. I'm going to tell you about a $20 bill. Now, most of you realize the $20 bill has changed, the picture on it and all that. But when I started cooking hamburgers in 1943, for $20, you could buy 400 hamburgers. <laughs> Think about that, friend. Now, this is going to mind boggle. As far as the, uh, that included 400 sodas, for $20, 400 bags of potato chips, or 400, for 80 bucks, we could have a real feast here tonight. I mean, we could go all the way, <laughs> full course dinner. For a one penny, which most of these vending machines are, gum and peanut machines and, uh, and the pinball machine, that is a, that's not a pinball machine, excuse me, that is a pinball table. There's nothing machine about it except it pulls back when you put a penny in it. 2,000 plays on that machine for a $20 bill, 2,000 bubble gums out of that thing. 
We're talking about a $20 bill. Some of you remember that, but you never thought about how many you could buy. When we sell a hamburger right now for $2.25, we used to have to sell 45 hamburgers to gross $2.25. Times have changed. Now, consequently, this is Tuesday. It is my birthday. Please, no applause. I was born, <laughs> I was born on Tuesday. I celebrate every Tuesday. <laughs> and, but it is also Fat Tuesday, kind of <laughs> fits in. It is also Super Tuesday. <laughs> and as of the stock market this afternoon, 374 points down, it may be known as a Black Tuesday. <laughs> So it's a pretty strong Tuesday we're having here tonight, and maybe the drought will even break at about midnight. Who knows? Now, real quick, uh, so that you can understand some of these stories, I'm going to tell you about we had the People's Cafe in the, in the 200 block of East Irwin, 1936 to 1943. We had the Candy Kitchen. My Uncle Namie opened it. Not Mamie, Namie, but nobody could say Namie, so everybody called him Mamie. Uncle Namie opened in 1912, and we closed in 1955. We had Jeffrey's Ladies Ready to Wear downtown for 25 years, 1952 to 1977. I've had this building that I'm in right now on the 200 block of Ferguson since 1978. My uncle had the Blackstone Drugstore from 1943 to 54. And we had Camel's Trading Post that belonged to Uncle Namie, probably from 46 to 53. It was an Army Navy store. He came out of retirement to open that Army Navy store, I think, to get away from home and all that noise. He had seven kids. But <laughs> the alleys downtown were my playground. I grew up. I used to walk to town when I was two or three years old. But my big brother brought me, and he was five. And we walked to town, and, and uh, I played in those alleys. And, of course, nobody bothered me because my father was a legend in his own time. That's a cowboy boy. Leave him alone, and everybody did. And I just had a wonderful time. Now, we had buses, and a lot of times I rode the bus. Bus was nine cents, 15 cents for adults. You could use a bus token. But when I was nine years old, I weighed 180. I only weigh 300 now. I haven't gained that much weight. <laughs> My father literally had to take me around to the bus stop to the bus drivers on different shifts and say, this little boy is not 12. He is only nine. Don't try to charge him for because they frustrated me. They wouldn't. They didn't want me to get on the bus. Said so you can't be nine. You got to be at least fourteen. I said nine. You was just a big boy. I haven't grown that much. But the buses went north, west, south, and east every twenty minutes. It's called the Toller Transit, and we had a lot of bus use, especially during the war years and before, and before the war years and slightly thereafter. A lot of people didn't have cars. Now then. The candy kitchen itself was a hangout, and I mean literally a hangout. We had big fans in the ceiling, and we had ice-cold drinks, Coca-Cola, and it was a hangout for a lawman, all the policemen, highway patrol, sheriffs and the sheriff, deputies, and they came there for their refreshments. And the professional people, a lot of lawyers and doctors and dentists and all those people came there. It was just kind of an afternoon place to have your Cokes and all that. Now, Whole families came there, a lot of whole families, especially on Friday night and Saturday. And I learned a lot from those people. And then, of course, during the war years, uh, the police, some of the police officers would come over to listen to the radio. Daddy had radio back there in the back, and they listened to Gabriel Heater. Some of you remember, good news tonight, and there's bad news tonight. Gabriel Heater was very popular. So it was a, we're going to get to some of those stories in just a minute. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to quickly try to just point out a few little things, like there were fire sales. We had a man who had a store next to a store that had a fire. And he got some water and smoke damage. And I guess it was kind of like the, the Kennedy Memorial. It was an ongoing perpetual sale. I asked my father, how long does that sale last? I would see these trucks pull up in the alley. And look, he had plenty of big trucks unloading all this merchandise. So this guy has a fire sale. I learned all about fire sales. He just shook his head. He had a wig doing like, like, <laughs> they're crazy. Okay, Tyler went wet for 13 months. Most of you know that. Back in the late 30s, for 13 months, we got to sell beer downtown. And that's about everybody did it. And he went in quart bottles mostly instead of long neck bottles. Now, speaking of law enforcement officers, I can finally remember several. Now, you got to remember that the city police department 
put a police officer on each side of the square. There was one on the south side, one on the north, west, east. That man was also responsible for going down Spring Street or going down wherever his beat was, he went up and down that street. Some of those people were, and I finally remember them, it was Mr. Oscar Burnett, who been there a long time, Sergeant Jack McCurdy, one of my favorites, who wouldn't miss Gabriel Heater if he had to walk across the square, Sergeant Johnson, and Sergeant Rice. I'm sorry I can't recall their first names because they were much, much older than me at that time, and I, I call them Mr. Johnson Mr. Rice. But they both made sergeants. Now, a little quick story about Sergeant Rice. Sergeant Rice was the older of all these people, and to me, of course, he looked very, very old as a small boy looking up, but he told me a story, first person story, that in the prime of Bonnie and Clyde, it's Arcadia Theater, and right next to the Arcadia Theater, Albert Solly's daddy, Alice Albert, God rest her soul, was here last year, had a confectionery there, I think the Royal, was right next to the Arcadia. Bonnie and Clyde pulled up in front of the Arcadia. A lady got out. Mr. Rice is standing on the south side of the square. Now, if you remember, legend has it that the Arp State Bank got robbed by Bonnie and Clyde. I don't know whether it did or not. I wasn't there, but there, it, it is uh, assumed that they robbed. So it was about that time. They had a calling all cars type thing where they notified the police officers that Bonnie and Clyde were, were suspected to be in this area, described the car, gave them the license plate number. Now, Mr. Rice is standing almost in front of the candy kitchen when here comes Bonnie and Clyde's car parked in front of the Arcadia. Most of you know about the downtown. A girl jumps out. She's going in to get some ice cream. Mr. Rice is looking over there. He tells me this story. He is looking over there. And he starts walking across the middle of the street. It's in the afternoon and there's very little traffic. And he starts walking across and he's out in the street. And he said maybe he's 50 or 75 feet away from the car. And all of a sudden, his shotguns and machine guns come out the window and point right at him. And he has a 38 six shooter on him. That's all they carried in those days. No radios, none of that, no time bombs, none of that. He holds his hands out like this. And he's telling me this. And he said, now, you people, just wait just a minute. Now, I know who you are. I think I do. I want you to get what you're going to get and get on out of here. Now, I'm not going to bother you. And he said, I just held my hands out like this. <laughs> that was a little bit smarter than <laughs> slapping leather. The lady comes out with the ice cream. And she sees him, and she starts to run. He said, now, lady, you just calm down now and start and just get on in that car, and y'all just get on out of here. And the lady jumped in the car, and they went down Spring Street, and he runs to the nearest phone and called for help. They're gone. Now, that's a true story told by Mr. Rice. God rest his soul. All right. We had Constable Lewis, and Constable Lewis was probably Tyler's only constable. Can you all hear me okay back there in the back? If you can't hear, hold up your hand. Okay. That vaudeville will never die. Constable Lewis was a very red-complected gentleman, kind of short, one of the nicest people I ever met in my life. I loved him, one of my heroes. He would sit there in the afternoon, drink that soda pop, sit under that fan and tell me stories endlessly. I mean, like, not for hours, but like he'd tell me a story and later he'd come back and tell me another story, and I loved him. Now, he talked about bootleggers, and I'm going to tell you some of the things. He also talked about some hangings we had downtown. We're not going to go into that. And some burnings, and we won't go into that at least one, but he told me about bootleggers, and real quick, I'm going to tell you about bootleggers. There was one man that they kept going to his farmhouse, and they couldn't catch him, and this is what he did. He goes, uh, is Smith still here? I want you to take notes. Is J.B. still here? Take notes, J.B. All right, this is serious now. They went to this guy's farmhouse, and they couldn't catch him selling whiskey. And what was the man doing when they finally caught up with him? He had a little trap door built in the wall. It's a little door. And he had this, it's the same principle as today's modern vending machines, Coke machines and all that. It has a big board going up inside the wall. The man pushes a bottle of whiskey in there and pushes another one and they keep rolling up this hill. When he pulls one out, the other just rolled down and all he had to open was this little door. Pull you out a bottle of whiskey, see? And that way when they searched the house, they couldn't find it. They wouldn't look for a hole in the wall. That was one. Another fella had potatoes right outside White House. And you go there to buy these sweet potatoes, and potatoes, whatever he had going, crappies get going. 
And he'd go out there and get you a half a bushel of potatoes and, and pull them out of the ground and bring them in. But when he's doing all that, he had a bottle of whiskey, one of the corn squeezes, and put it in the bottom of that, the bottom of that basket and then cover them with potatoes. See, if somebody watching with binoculars, you would think he was buying a half a bushel of potatoes. And really, you got a bottle of whiskey. There was another fellow, and I won't call his name, had a shoe store downtown. You go in there and see a guy coming out with a shoe box. That's right. A bottle of whiskey in that shoe box with a string around it. And he was selling it in broad daylight. Mr. Lewis told me all these people that they caught. But bootlegging was real serious. Now, they were serious about bootleggers then like they are dope dealers now. I mean, it was big time. They just about ignore the bootleggers now. I mean, like, who cares? You can drive for 15 minutes and be, you know, what's a big deal? Except selling them to kids, of course. Now, telling you about the hamburger that we made at the candy kitchen. Things were a little bit different in those days. We didn't buy patties already frozen with the paper and nothing, just open the box and start throwing them. We had to make meatballs. You buy a big thing of meat just like you do now at Super One or something, ground meat, and you made the meatballs round and put them in these big bowls and put them in the cooler. And the guy in the front frying hamburgers, when he wanted meat, he says meat, and you'd run one of those big crocs of meatballs to him. So you'd have to make hundreds and hundreds of meatballs to supply these people. Now when you go to one of these chain stores, you buy onions, I mean, they put onions on the hamburger almost without exception, and they're doing it to cut down on their labor. You get pre-cut onions, so they're already chopped. Well, we chopped our own onions. There was a tremendous amount of chopping. To chop 100 pounds of onions in one afternoon, just put them up in jars, put lids on them, because we could have them for the big weekends. We kept the grill real hot. Now, this is something you're not going to believe. The hamburger buns, we had to slice every one of them. Now, the sliced bread came out in the 30s, most of you know, and, uh, you know, best invention since sliced bread. But when the war years came, somebody had the idea the bakery is using a lot of blades, a lot of metal to slice all this bread and buns. And we could save a lot of metal for the war effort if we eliminated those blades at all these bakeries all over the United States. So they eliminated the blades and used the metal for the government, and they start sending out bread and buns, hot dog and hamburger buns. And there's a, a bread knife right over there, just exactly one I use myself. You get real good at it. You cut yourself once, and then you never do it again. You get real good. <laughs> now, the bakery, we had a bakery. We were blessed. We had a bakery, ideal bakery. Mr. Vanderpoo told me on many occasions that my father was his biggest account. And that included grocery stores and everything else. And you got to figure we're selling one or two buns at a time. And these other people are selling by the package. Coca-Cola gave him an award for selling more Coca-Cola than anybody in this part of Texas. Now, to, real quick on these hamburgers, they weren't as big as a Whataburger, I promise you. But they weren't little bitty. A lot of people think they were little. They were not little. They were the same size as a regular hamburger. Now, we had a lot of troops that come here during the war. And a lot of them came from California. And a lot of them came from the Philippines. Nicest people you ever met. But you could tell when one of those Filipino soldiers had just gotten here. He would see us. We fried hamburgers right in the front window. There's a plate glass window right there, and the grill is right there, and everybody walking by could see you frying them. They walk right in the door, and they're right there. And you sit down at the counter, and you order. They'd walk in and see those hamburgers on that grill, and they didn't look that big to them. When a guy first got here, he'd order three hamburgers. He'd eat two, maybe one, he'd give the rest of that. Well, he didn't do that but once. But you could always tell he just get, he said, just get into town. You know, <laughs> the guy always ordered three hamburgers. That's a, a but, the, but they were so good, I, could, I used to eat three every day for lunch and three for supper and then go home and eat. <laughs> but I'm just like a chicken. It don't show in my face. <laughs> this is that bread knife. I put it over here and forgot about it. This is what I cut buns with. <laughs> Boy, you got to be fast because the cook would get on you. Now, I'm going to tell you about the one cent. You know, a while ago I mentioned one cent, and I'm going to mention this gentleman's name because I had, had the highest respect for him. He had one of the most beautiful stores downtown. Mr. Schombrum had the New York store, great big store on the corner. In front of his store, there was a bus stop that I mentioned earlier. During the war years and right before and after, people would gather there. 50 or 60 at a time, especially in the evening, to get those buses back to North Tyler. That's where that bus was going out Spring Street. And then a lot of domestic help came, walked to town, or the people dropped them off at that bus stop. And it was always a lot of people in front of the New York store waiting on the bus. 
Well, out in front of his place, he had one of those what we call lollipop scales, round at the top and comes down, great big white scale. He told my father, I was standing right there when he said it. They called that a Jeff, his friends did. His enemies didn't talk about it. He said, Jeff, that scale in front of him, he pointed at it. We walk around the square, Daddy and I getting fresh air, see. I always walk around the square with Daddy. He said, you see that scale? He said, I got enough pennies out of that scale to send both of my boys through college. Is that incredible? Now, you got to think about it. That scale was paid for. And those pennies, all you had to do is take them out and count them. There was no merchandise changing hands. You already spent all the money you're going to spend. All you had to do is count the pennies. But he actually said that. I assume it's true. Now, during the war years, talking about space, we had about 50 stores on the square, where I could estimate it. But when the war years came, they rented everything, upstairs, the basements, the main floors, and in some cases, the staircases. If a store happened to have a staircase on the inside and a staircase on the outside, I mean staircase going upstairs, they rented that little bit of space to somebody, like selling war souvenirs, a taller souvenir, the roads. They rented everything downtown. It was unbelievable. You got to remember that you couldn't build anything. See, there was no building material. You couldn't buy anything. It was, everything was just locked in, and what you saw was what you got. And it was downtown, a beautiful downtown. The war came, and the soldiers came, and they came, and they came. By the thousands, there was a solid wall of khaki. They were there, and they were the nicest people. They just came on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in droves. I, I, I cannot hardly tell you that you could hardly walk on the sidewalk. Toys got made out of plastic. Being a little kid, I was important. We, we couldn't get Hershey bars or bubble gum or cigarettes or gasoline or tires or sugar or rubber or metal. Now, the metal seemed to be one of the most precious things in the United States. We needed it for the war effort. And this was the greatest movement of recycling for some of you younger people. And they should still be doing that, in my opinion, but it probably cost more than it's worth. The cry was for metal. Across the street from the Liberty, you got to remember the Camel's Candy Kitchen was right next to the Liberty Theater, right on the south side of the square. Directly across the street, under one of those giant oak trees, they built this large pen with chicken wire and one by fours. And they, be, and they hung Hitler, a dummy of Hitler, hang this way, look, uh, on this rope. And the idea was to cover Hitler up with metal, cans, pots and pans, any kind of metal. And boy, you talk about it. We gathered up things. My grandma chased me for three days. I got one of her best pots. I said, I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> but it was so heavy. I said, this is it. Where's my pot? I said, Hitler got it. Hitler just <laughs> In the movies, we stole, they sold stamps between movies. And if you look at Channel 18, some of those old movies that made during the war, at the end, it says the end. It has a little stamp on there of that Liberty Soldier. And it says, buy your stamps here at this theater. They turn on the lights, and the ushers would come through there with cans and say, you war stamps, 10 cents apiece. I mean, everybody fought for the cause, and of course, uh, war bonds. But that was a time when America was just unbelievably wonderful. Now, the candy that we made, <clears throat> and I'm going to brag a little bit, was about as good as one fella said, uh, it's the best candy I ever wrapped a lip around. My daddy made all kind of candy, but his specialty was peanut brittle and coconut brittle. One day, <clears throat> here comes his full colonel, followed by a colonel and a major right, right behind him. I'm a little kid now. You got to understand, I'm very impressed. I've been walking around the square during my breaks, you know, saluting these guys. But here they come into the store. And my daddy's right over here. And they said, uh, Mr. Camel, And he said, yes, sir. I said, uh-oh, they think can take my daddy to the war. <laughs> Come in and get him. He was about a year too old. Anyway, the man started telling my father what the deal was. He said, sir, I got to tell you something. He said, yes. He said, you don't realize this, but we have been sending people in here buying your candy. And we sent it off to the uh, 
some federal health lab they had somewhere. I couldn't remember the details, but the, the, the thing of the story is they sent the candy off. He said it came back 100% pure. It's been proven pure. Now, what we want to know, that is what, you didn't have to send it off. I could have told you that. It's <laughs> pure candy. The man wants to know if we will make two pounds of candy for each soldier in Camp Fannin for Thanksgiving. Two pounds, I don't, I don't even know how many pounds there was, but it has to be like 30,000. The old man said, well, candy was 35 cents a pound. The brittle was high dollar, the other was 25. He said, I'll do it and I'll do it for 25 cents because I want to contribute some of these boys not coming back. And the family got together and he called in uncles and cousins and all the old candy makers that had been there so long and then they came in and they worked day and night. I was too young. I watched the front and worked and fried hamburgers and stuff like that, but I didn't stay up all night. And they fried all that hamburger. And when it was over, the man came back, brought a letter of thank you from the commander at the Camp Fan, and I wished I had it. And he said he wanted to thank him. He said, now, would you do it for Christmas? And I thought the old man was going to throw him out. He said, he said, no, but I'll make you one pound for each man. And he said, what about sugar? He said, I need sugar. He said, you know, uh, y'all use all my sugar. He said, oh, that's by the way. And he asked this other guy, opens up this thing and comes out with this letter, says, you don't have to worry about sugar anymore, period, ever, because we figured out that 98% of your customers are soldiers, and your, and your sugar is going to the troops anyway, even though they're buying it, and we decided to give you all sugar you wanted. And I swear to you, they bring those flatbed trucks and park in front of the daddy's candy kitchen, and these big black men are strong, Throw it. They sugar came in 100 pound bags in those days. It's 40 pound bales now. 100 pound bag, they throw one on each shoulder. And they'd unload that whole flatbed truck, stack it up in the kitchen, just high enough for us to be able to reach one off the top. And the crowd, I'm going to say 150 people, were standing there watching all it because they couldn't get a cup of sugar and they're looking at tons of sugar. <laughs> but the old man, didn't ask for it, they just got it for him. And they said, and they were right. All the, we sold so much produce, and that's a produce hatchet over there, and that's an apple box in that corner by that globe, by the way. Some of you never saw an apple box. We sold so much produce to those soldiers that they passed a rule that they couldn't bring any more produce into the camp. They're taking barrel bags, they're making too much litter, the peelings, you know, and the apple cores and all that. That lasted about six weeks. I asked one of those guys, I said, what do they do with the, when y'all do sneak it in? They said, they give it to the officers. I said, well, that's great. <laughs> and that lasted about six weeks and they pull that band and let them bring anything they want in there. Now, downtown on the square, and I'm gonna try to wrap this up pretty quick. On the, on the square, this is the square, the perimeter. I want you to see this. The courthouse is in the middle. You see this American flag? Everybody's seen American flags. Now, I used this one in the, 50s when I had my traveling show when I was in school, and that's why it says Rodney. But that staff on that flag is original. Probably goes way back. Because downtown, in front of every store, in the sidewalk, there was a hole drilled in the sidewalk in front of your store. And on every conceivable occasion, or even some people did, like we did every day, stick your flagpole out there in that hole, and every night you brought in your flag, and the whole downtown was covered with American flags, and it was beautiful. And I wish they'd do it again. Now, those holes are gone, but that is the, sh that is the original staff. I've got the old flag, but it's wool, and it's moth-beaten, and I'm afraid I'd better not put it on display, because it really... Now, they had benches all around the square. And those benches, some people had the office there, you know. <laughs> they didn't conduct any business, but I'm sure they remember the benches. And on Saturday, we had the preacher. And those preachers would holler and scream, and I couldn't understand a word they said. The man came over there, and I said, Daddy, ask that man. He's over every Saturday sitting right in front of it. Ask him, what did that man say? Now, I'm not making fun, you understand, because I'm sure the man's attention. I don't hear that Bible. He's hitting that Bible, and he's screaming, and I couldn't understand it. And Daddy said, what did he say? And that man said, he's pouring it on. He's pouring it on. So another fellow came in and I said, ask him, Daddy. And he said, he's pouring it on. And three of them, he's pouring it. They didn't know what he's saying either. <laughs> <laughs> Those 
those people would sit there, and this man jumping up and down, and they looking straight ahead at the traffic, and nobody made eye contact with this man, nobody. So, I mean, I, but he did every day from daylight to dark. Well, that was great. Uh, he got the word out. Now, the birds. Oh, my goodness. I was nine years old before I found out what kind of birds they were. I thought there's damn birds. Them damn birds. I them. My cousin came down here from New York. He was with the Army, and he came to this camp, and he said, what kind of birds are they? And I said, damn birds. He said, shut up, boy. Well, that's what they Them damn birds. I said, I got to tell you, my brother, uh, uh, my brother's daughter is here tonight, and she doesn't know this story. Hold up your hand, Mona. That's my niece, Mona Camel. There she is right there. Now, my brother is two years older than me. He looks younger, but he is older. And that boy, to this very day, keeps a car that is so clean that you could eat off the hood. That boy is a radical by keeping his car clean. Now, my daddy bought 1947 Nash when the war was over. First chance he got to buy a car in 19, oh, I'd say 52 or so. He still had it. He let my brother have it. My brother got to Nash. Daddy had a 50 Buick. Now, my brother's going out one night with a bunch of his buddies, and they're going to the Arcadia. I'm going out with a bunch of my buddies, and we're going to the Tyler or the Liberty or wherever. My brother said all afternoon, wash that car. Oh, he washed, he cleaned, he cleaned the tire. Yeah, man, it was beautiful. And he came out that night, went to the show. He parked way down there on Spring Street, away from those trees, those big oak trees around the courthouse. <laughs> Millions of birds. You got it. I came out of the show with my buddies, and I, I saw my brother's carver, and I had the keys in my pocket because we kept, we kept the keys like that. And I, uh, I took that. Nash, you got it, pulled it under the tree. And uh, my buddy and I, we went down the street and we hid and waited till the movie was over. My brother comes down, he looks where his car, his car wasn't there, and he comes doing this. He's very dramatic anyway. He says, he says <laughs> where's my car, you know? And somebody says, is that it over there? And of course, it is completely covered. It was a maroon car, but it looked like a bed sheet. It looked like a, a bed sheet. I'm like, oh. And he said, what happened? He, and to this day, I'm scared to tell it. <laughs> he don't know nothing about it. <clears throat> now, the traffic on the square was two-way. Wasn't one way now, two-way. Cars going both ways. The parking was up against the curb, not parallel. Now here comes the new engineer going to change all that. Going to put all this traffic going one way. Well, he puts traffic one way. Now he's got to have some one-way streets. Do not enter. He got big signs out on Irwin and on Spring Street and everywhere, do not enter. On both sides, it says one way, one way, and they put this thing out in the middle of the street that somebody ran over, I swear, every single day. But it was in the middle of the street. <laughs> do not enter. And some old man is Saturday night and business was kind of slow that, uh, and that old man told my daddy, he said, you know what, that I, I tried to come up here, I said, ever why I tried to, said, do not enter. And that is, yes, the people think there's a plague in the city. <laughs> and that, that's the truth. That's what it looked like. Do not enter. It's a warning, you know. Anyway, business picked up in about three months after everybody ran over their signs. They finally gave up and moved the signs. We had all the big stores downtown, Sears, Ward's, Penny's, Mary Schmidt, which is later Dillard's, all the big stores were downtown before they went to the mall. Now, let me tell you something real quick. Yeah, Randy might have heard this story. This is the legend. Of course, we owe Randy a lot because he remodeled the Lewis Hotel, brought back the old jail, and he went and started something because everybody followed him, and they've been trying to do the same. Now, the story is the Lewis Hotel, the Lewis Brothers, Nice guys, I knew them well. Of course, it was a boom during the oil field, during the war, the hotel was gold mine. And it started down there. Sears and Roebuck came along and offered to buy the Lewis Hotel. They're gonna put Sears and Roebuck there. And the Lewis brothers wanted $40,000. That's what I heard. Wanted 40,000 and Sears wouldn't pay it. They went back and forth. Finally, Sears put Sears where it was on Broadway. The question we have today is, we'll never know, if Sears had put that building where the Lewis Hotel is, would Tyler have gone out Irwin Street instead of going down Broadway? That's a mystery we'll never know. 
And I don't blame the Lewis brothers, by God, I'd have held out too. <laughs> now we had a little man that went around the neighborhoods called Emory, and he sold ice cream out of this little cart with the things, and he rang his bell, and he was a great guy, and we loved him, and you get your nickel, go give him. But downtown, we had Charlie. Charlie was probably the only Hispanic that I knew, other than this little girl I went to Bonner School with named Sylvie. Nice guy, didn't say much, wore green glasses and a cowboy straw hat. And he had a push cart with bicycle wheels on it, insulated, made out of wood, but it's insulated. And got these wooden things. Brenda Elrod would have had a stroke. <laughs> But they were delicious hot tamales. And we bought them and we took them home and we enjoyed them. He wrapped hot tamales in newspaper, put them in that thing, keep them hot. You stop there and I saw Buick's Cadillac and everything else. Big shots came in with the Charlie stayed down on the corner by the railroad track in the 200 block of Irwin and sold hot tamales. I wish we had that. He remembers them right there. I wish we had those hot tamales back. The old man was great. We had downtown, we had the high school, Tall High. We had Tall Junior College, Tall Commercial College. Tyler Institute and Tyler Barber College and I don't know what else, but that's one. I'm talking about downtown. You could walk to any one of the churches, the Methodist, the Baptist, the Episcopal, all these churches, the Catholic Church. That was my break. Sunday morning, I could go to church. Boy, I'd take off, run all the way to church, you know, turn and run all the way back to the store and call that a break. But I did cook hamburgers. I, my daddy never asked me to work. He never asked my brother to work. It was truly a volunteer deal. But I loved it. Now, he believed in going eight hours a day, twice a day. <laughs> I stayed with him. In fact, after I got older and he'd go home, he'd go, when I'd walk in, he'd walk out and go over to the dress shop. He liked the dress shop. It was real modern, air conditioned, real modern front. We're going to get back here in a minute. And he loved it over there. As soon as I'd walk in, I'd be putting an apron on, he'd put his hat on. He'd gone out to, to manage the store, and I ran the candy kitchen, he ran, and he'd call me on Saturday night, come home, I'd stay up there because I was doing a heck of a business on the place open. All those kids get out of the show. I did a great business. Now, we had milk and ice. Even when I was a boy, I delivered in milk and ice wagons. I'm sure you all remember that with the rubber tires and the horse. And uh, the one experience I remember with the milk wagon now, they came in our neighborhood, and they had a big gray horse. Seemed like all the milk horses looked alike. It was a red, big old gray spotted horse. And they had blinders on. And we were just kids, and we had all the fireworks we wanted because Daddy sold lots of firecrackers. And uh, the New Ad Brothers, Froggy's Boys, and my brother and I and a couple other kids in the neighborhood. And we didn't even think about that horse. We were innocent. And that horse was parked across the street in Mr. Allison's house, and the man went upstairs delivering milk when one of the boys, they're all older than me, put a firecracker under a can and fired that firecracker. And you got it, that horse hooked him, and he made the route without the drive. <laughs> that man came out, and we pointed, all those kids pointed, he went, and that man took, and I'm not lying, it was an hour later, the man came back with his horse, and he wanted to tell us. He was out of breath and still out of breath. And he, said, he said, I thought he was going to beat up on him. Don't ever do that. <laughs> Poor man, he really. But that horse lit out, and I have never forgot that. I will never forget it. Now, we mentioned, oh, yeah, in the 50s downtown, and some of my old buddies are here. The pool halls were downstairs, domino parlors. And uh, we're not going to a long story about them, but in the 50s, long before I even dreamed about it, uh, going to the city council, the city council banned the fireworks from the, from the, being sold in city limits. And then a little bit later, they, they banned the pool halls. And in, in, in these instances, one, the fire marshal said, we had a drought that year until the fireworks were going to burn down the city. And the next time, the, the daddies and mamas complained about their kids going to the pool hall. And it was years and years and years later before you know, on the council that we put pool halls back. We did not put fire works back. Now, parades. We had lots of parades. We had the Christmas parade. Santa Claus came in person and stayed on the square three weeks before Christmas. They played music out of the tower of the old courthouse, Christmas music, all day long into the night. It was beautiful. The whole square was decorated. 
So that's Christmas and Christmas parade. Santa Claus gave away his little stick candy. Big deal. We had the Rose Festival Parade downtown, glorious. We had an army parade. To me, as a kid that was in love with the military, I mean, I would have gone with them in a New York minute. I changed my mind a little later. All right. <laughs> Thousands of soldiers marching, and then they finally decided those tanks might tear up the streets, so they take the tanks out of the parade, but they did have several marches. Now, you talk about flags and people and cheering. It was American as the 4th of July. We had circus parades. The elephants, the whole thing, circus parade, was taken out to wherever they put the tent. I'm too young to remember. Now, the Shriners had a great parade. When they had their potentate or something like that, boy, I mean, they had a beautiful parade. They had all dignitaries and governors and all kind of senators, all kind of people in the Shrine Parade. It was very impressive. And then, of course, before my time in the 20s, and I know most of you have heard about it, we had the most spectacular parade of all, which consisted of more people, the way I understand it, as the Ku Klux Klan, when they lined up four abreast on foot, and then they came on horses four abreast. And the way I understand it, the, the, it started some way out on the Texas Highway Department building, and it went all the way down uh, around the square and ended up right down the corner here. And, the, and when the, end, the beginning of the parade stopped here, the end had not left the Highway Department building. Now that's thousands of men. To, to make this into a more cheerful point. My father used to get shaved every day from his barber, who was named, also named Lewis. I can't tell you his last name, Lewis. Daddy went there every day and got his, every morning got to shower, got to shave, and, and, and Lewis had a lip, but he went sideways, kind of like that. Well, they all got those hoods on, they're marching, and all these people. You got to remember, I got a book over there that shows 1919, 1920, the Dunn book, Dunn and Bradstreet. There were 16 Lebanese families on the square. And of course, there was a lot of Jewish people on the square. And then there was a few of the others. But the majority were either Catholic Lebanese or Lebanese uh, Roman Catholic, I mean, uh, Greek Orthodox Catholic, or Jewish people. So the Ku Klux natural enemy was downtown. They weren't their enemies, they were ours. Anyway, they marched, and Lewis had a lift. And when he walked by, he had to be on the end. He came right by Daddy's candy kitchen. All these merchants standing out there just looking at him. And Daddy said, hey, goes Lewis. And the guy turned around. <laughs> 10,000 men in one look. The next, the next morning, the man is shaving him. Daddy said, I saw you in the parade. Be careful with that raisin. <laughs> He said, the old man laughed, and Lewis laughed about it, he laughed. But everybody belonged to the Klan, you know, anybody's anybody. All right, we had five and 10 cent stores downtown. I'm gonna to try to teach you, we had McClellan's and Penny's, I mean, excuse me, Perry's, uh, the Perry Brothers, the Davenport's, the Crest. We had a Walgreens drugstore on the corner there, and uh, Brooks' first store was there in the 20s. And we had our theaters, the Arcadia, the Liberty, the Joy, the Toller, the Majestic. The Majestic was known as the Bloody Bucket. Now, the way I understand it, and this is all I, the stories I heard, man was in the balcony, he got in an argument with this other man, the other man stuck him with a knife. The boy comes, the victim comes down, his brother's out on the sidewalk, he tells his brother, that man cut me with a knife, so here comes the assailant, and his brother, and he cut his brother, he cut both the brothers, but upstairs, downstairs, and outside, so they called it the bloody bucket. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, the picture show cost five cents. It went up to nine cents, 25 cents to go to the Majestic, and 30, 35 cents to go to Liberty. Now, during the war, when all these soldiers came to town. You gotta remember, all of these rural people came to town on Saturday. There was enough to fill up the town. On Saturday was the day. But now the army gets loose and puts them on top of that. And they stood out in front of the picture show. Some of these guys are squat down waiting because they fill up the picture show, the, the majestic delivery, fill them up. They show the movie. Most of them, if you'll look at Channel 18 again, hour and five, hour and 10 minutes was the movie. Movie's over, lights come on, everybody out, they fill it up again. People waiting outside to get in. Of course, they're eating hamburgers down the street, thank God. <laughs> now we're gonna rush right along. Some of you getting sleepy. Uh, we had a sheriff back in those days. There was a lot of law and order that we're not allowed to have anymore. 
They had every law enforcement officer carried with him a lie detector test. Well, right here on the back of his head, tell me the truth, boy. <laughs> well, they, they can't do that no more. <laughs> we had one sheriff who made a, issued his warrants without any help from the constable, and this is, this is not legend, this is fact. He'd go down the bus station, that's where they hung up. He'd tap a guy from behind and say, hey, boy, come down to my office at 9 o'clock in the morning. And the guy turned himself in. I mean, it was that simple. Every once in a while, somebody said, huh, blah, on the floor. <laughs> Maybe make myself clear, be at my office at 90, yes, sir, and they turn themselves in. We didn't have a lot of trouble. Well, they can't do that anymore. They got a lot of rights. We don't have no rights. They do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now, the hotel. <laughs> we had a lot of hotels. We, of course, had our beautiful hotel, Blackstone. My uncle had the drugstore in the Blackstone Hotel, and some of this stuff, like those soda dishes and the, the chocolate Sunday thing, and, stuff, and this punch board came out of that drugstore. That was a beautiful place. We had the Blackstone Drug. We had the Milner Hotel that came down in 1955. I helped to tear it down, in fact. But, I mean, it wasn't poured in. I did it, <laughs> I did it as labor. And the Lewis Hotel, and the Plaza, and the Carlton, and the Midget. Well, well that was an outstanding place. And, uh, and on Spring Street. <laughs> We had another little hotel, I can't tell you the name, but it's right there where the Rooster's office is. Troy Theater was right across the street. Now real quick, we had, this is some of the things we had downtown that you may not think about. Of course, we had cafes, drugstores, doctors, dentists, lawyers, oil companies, dry goods, three banks, shoe stores, shoe shops. We had police everywhere. We had gift shops, pool hall, domino parlor, jewelry stores, barbers, bakers, candy and ice cream kitchen. We had photo shops, we had cafe ladies stores, men's stores, and the bootleggers. We had shoe shine boys, five cents, everywhere. Newspaper boys out in the street with the newspaper, and extra, extra, wars over, or Hitler this, or that, or that, extras. I mean, just like in the movies, something we haven't had since the war. We had the preachers, the politicians, the gunsmiths, the keysmiths, pawn shops, arcades, penny arcades. Now, real quick. The cars came out in 1947. If you had an extra $600, you slip it under the counter, you give the guy, you got your name up on the list. They caught one of the dealers. I mean, they made headlines. One of the dealers got caught and had to give all those people back their $600. The wagon yard, farmer's market, used cars, a few, not many, $50, $65 for a Model T. We had a jail, which was a red brick building, and we had the uh, uh, a bathroom there for the Afro-American. It was another white brick building beside it in, next to the alley. They weren't allowed to use the bathrooms in the courthouse, and they had to go. It was a nice building, and uh, they had an attendant there. And, but that was it. That was part of the law. Now, as far as that wagon yard, it was a big farmer's market. A lot of produce changed hands. But the thing I remember most was this gentleman, and when my feet hurt me, when my back hurt from standing over that grill or cooking that candy for hours, I hear that man holler, and it inspired me to go forward. And I'm not trying to tell a sad story, but the man was extremely deformed, I mean physically deformed. And the first person there in the morning on Saturday and the last guy to leave was this man selling peanuts. And he just had use of one hand and could push that. And that man would holler, whoop, whoop, peanuts. Peanut, that's all he could say. And people would bring him a nickel and buy peanuts. And every time I got to hurt, and I said, if that man could stay out there in that hot sun at the wagon yard for 18 hours, by God, I could fry hamburgers where I get all I want to eat. And he kept me inspired, and I know he's in heaven, but he taught me something. Hard work, and you can do it. You can make it. My creditors don't believe it. Now then, <laughs> we'll skip that one. That's, I didn't know the preacher was going to be here. All right, let's see. <laughs> Before I quit, I gotta tell you, of course, Uncle Naomi, I told you he had an Army Navy store when he retired, we forget about that. Now we're gonna tell you a couple more things and I promise you I'm gonna quit. Yeah. Okay. Now we're talking about inflation. If Alan Greenspan had been there, <laughs> he would have panicked. It started out, this announcement was earth shaking. Camel's Candy Kitchen was famous for its hamburgers. We went up from five cents to 10 cents in 1944. 
a giant step forward. Now, almost all the food places followed suit behind us because we sold more than the rest of them, and they, when we went up, they went up. We kind of set the price. Now, in the early 50s, my father made this announcement at the dinner table. We're going to go up to 15 cents on hamburgers. Silence. Well, that's not so bad. <laughs> if it had been 20 cents, I'd probably be in uh, Florida right now. All right, anyway, we're going to go to 15 cents. But then he said, and he was a very charitable man, he said, but the poor people are not going to be able to eat. And that's when the announcement came. We are going to put hot dogs on the menu for 10 cents. Huh? Camels has been selling hamburgers for 40 something years and we're gonna put a hot dog and he said the poor people gotta have something to eat. Now is that pitiful? We put the hot dog, we sell 500 hamburgers, one hot dog, but if a guy didn't have 15 cents, the old man didn't want him to go without. And soda water was still in the, we call it soda water until the soldiers got here and they start calling it pop. And I thought, he said, what kind of pop you got? I said, he's Lebanese, he's standing right over there. <laughs> I wouldn't know what the hell they were talking about, but then we found out what pop was, and we started calling it soda pop, but it was always soda water. Now, here comes the worst part of inflation as a child. You've got to remember this. Now, I'm seven years old when this took place. I'm guessing right now from the year. We had all kind of chewing tobacco and snuff and cigarettes and with a big cigar case, all this candy and all this produce. Now, I'm seven. Now, I'm not old enough to work behind the big counter with the hamburgers and all. I didn't start that until I was eight. I didn't say I wasn't big enough, I wasn't old. They put me over there just to watch the cigar counter and the tobacco, and I had a box back here, a wooden box, and tobacco came in, I'd kick it. Somebody wants something off the top shelf, I'd kick it and jump up on there and get that off the top shelf, I was too short. And this man comes in, and he wants a cut of dark brown mule chewing tobacco. Now, those old cutters right there is where they used to get them out of boxes and cut it. That was even before my time. But by the 40s, it came prepackaged. And the man, Daddy announced in the middle of the week that 10 cent chewing tobacco was now going to be 12 cents. Five cent snuff was going to be six cents. I mean, this is a giant increase in price. The man comes in and says, so boy, I said, give me, give me a plug of that dark brown mule. I said, yes, sir. And I jumped on my box and I came back down and I him. I said, that'd be 12 cents. Ba -ba. 12 cents! And he started screaming, 12 cents. I said, yes, sir, 12 cents. Daddy says 12 cents. 12 cents. I said, yes, sir, 12 cents. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And he started quoting the Bible. <laughs> the end of the world and damnation and doomsday and the, the, the world. And the, and the man totally, can, he gave me the 12 cents, but he is going into the end of the world thing. And the man's greed. And, and I'm standing there convinced that the world is coming to an end. <laughs> And the man leaves, and I grab a handful of baby roots, and I go, and Daddy said, what are you doing with all them baby roots? He came to see what that man was hollering. I said, Dad, the world's coming to the end. I ain't going to get no more baby roots. <laughs> I swear it's a true story. I was pigging out. If I'm going to heaven, I got a stomach for a baby root. <laughs> Alan Greenspan would not have believed that. All right. Now we're going to get to the sad part, and I'm going to quit two more items, so have faith. The courthouse that we all so dearly love, the memory of the courthouse. Because that window where I fried the hamburgers was right there in the front, I could see the courthouse through that front plate glass window. I saw it every single day for hours at a time, seven days a week. I came from high school, ran up there and fried hamburgers for 30 minutes of my 40-minute lunch period, ran back to the school, right out of school, I ran over there. I, did this, I just stayed in that store all the time. So I saw that thing. Now they started talking about tearing it down. And my father's best description to somebody when he thought they had lost their mind was that you crazy, which is in English crazy. <laughs> you crazy. And he heard about them talking about tearing that courthouse down, and he started beating his drum. He cornered those guys, those commissioners would come in, the county judge would come and get coke, and he would chew on them. You crazy about tearing that, that's a beautiful building. And he goes on and on about how well built it is and how gorgeous it is, and it's as good as anything they got in Europe. And 
smart of it. And then I like this red fox type relationship. I was always picking on him. I said, Daddy, uh, don't you want a new modern air conditioned? But they can air condition that old one. That's beautiful. And I started, you know, picking on him because he'd been raising so much devil about it. He was just, I mean, oh boy. I said, Daddy, they're going to have a big, beautiful modern meter. Come here, boy. You go across the street right now. You walk around that building. I said, I've been around 100. Do what I'm telling you. You go walk around that building. You've seen it, but you didn't see it. I want you to go up those steps. And the steps were worn. Some of you don't know that. But all those steps going up the front door had a groove in them where they were worn out. I couldn't believe that. Anyway, he's sitting across the street. So I walk around and I look and I came back. The man was right. It was a magnificent building, the granite and all that stone. And oh my God, he was right. But they tore it down. No, they tried to tear it down. They had the devil. The man that made the deal, now this is in the toilet paper, I'm sure you can look it up. The man that made the deal agreed to tear the thing down in X number of days or weeks or whatever. I can't tell you. The penalty was $200 a day for every day he went past that point. Now this is the guy that won the bid to tear it down. What they had was, according to the local paper and stories and all that, well, the blueprint did not show this giant slab of concrete that was holding up like the entire center of the building. And I think if Mr. Wilkins go do some research, you'll find out I'm telling the fact. They did not realize that big slab, huge slab of concrete was where it was. Now this is really gonna slow it down. The man is facing losing $200 a day. Now, we know how many hamburgers that is. <laughs> Out of a lot of money. So he strung string lights around that building. It's like he got an old used car lot, you know, light bulbs. And they work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, trying to tear that building down and meet the deadline. Mr. Wilkins may not know that, but it's part of our history. It's in the paper. That blueprint and that blue slab, they finally got that sucker down. Now, when they built the new courthouse, and this was in the paper. I started reading the paper in seventh grade, and I read it every day. I read the whole paper. I still do. But the paper also said the new courthouse was built, and I was going to shock everybody, for future plans so that we could add more stories to it. Now, nobody has mentioned that that I know of lately, that we can add more stories to the current courthouse. I don't think we want to. Three months after that building was built, the wall cracked. <laughs> now, one last one, and that is about the aluminum fronts on the buildings. Now, they start putting all the aluminum fronts all over there. Now, my father owns the building. I later bought it from him and sold it to the bank years later. He owned this building where the ladies ready to wear was. Beautiful, ornate front. It's in that picture down there, the courthouse picture. And I'll show it to you if you ever want to see it. Meanwhile, here comes this man around trying to get everybody to go aluminum fronts. Everybody thought that was the thing to do. Chamber of Commerce, everybody, we're gonna make this town modern. I pick up daddy that night, take him home. Broadway Video Studio can duplicate your videotapes. Eight millimeter, VHS, DV, any format to any format, analog, digital, or component, one copy, or a hundred. And European formats are not a problem. Broadway Video Studio is conveniently located